The four steps in this video will cover blood glucose regulation, including blood lactate, gluconeogenesis involving the Cori cycle, and both types 1 and 2 diabetes. When blood glucose drops, the liver can work to increase blood glucose levels. When blood glucose levels rise, the liver can respond by acting to decrease blood glucose. First, the response to an increase in blood glucose will be reviewed. Insulin acts on the liver to decrease blood glucose levels. The liver regulates blood glucose after being acted upon by either insulin or glucagon. Insulin and glucagon are both secreted by the pancreas. Insulin regulates an increase in blood glucose. Two main factors regulate insulin secretion by the pancreas, glucose in the blood and autonomic signaling. Glucose in the blood is detected by beta cells of the pancreas to secrete insulin. The more glucose in the blood, the more insulin the pancreas secretes, and as blood glucose levels drop, insulin secretion from the pancreas decreases. Additionally, signaling from the autonomic nervous system can regulate insulin secretion. During exercise, when the sympathetic nervous system is activated, insulin secretion is blocked. At rest, and when anticipating a meal or just after having a meal, the parasympathetic nervous system can stimulate the secretion of insulin. Therefore, insulin secretion may be the result of nervous system signaling and not necessarily a result of the amount of glucose in the blood. Insulin is able to regulate blood glucose through GLUT4 receptors. GLUT4 receptors are the receptors by which glucose most commonly enters cells. When insulin binds the insulin receptor, it causes the translocation of GLUT4 receptors from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. This increases the number of available receptors for glucose to enter the cells. As glucose levels in the blood rise, and there is more glucose in the blood than in the cells, a concentration gradient is formed. This concentration gradient causes the diffusion of glucose out of the blood and into the cells through the GLUT4 receptors. Blood glucose levels decrease as a result. To review the role of insulin, insulin causes an increase in the amount of GLUT4 receptors on cell membranes to allow glucose to diffuse out of the blood and into the cells, which lowers blood glucose levels. In type 1 diabetes mellitus, the beta cells of the pancreas are destroyed, and no insulin is secreted. Thus, glucose does not diffuse into cells through GLUT4 receptors. The glucose remains in the blood, resulting in severe hyperglycemia, and does not enter the cells, causing cell starvation. In type 2 diabetes mellitus, the beta cells are functional and there is plenty of insulin, but cells become less responsive to the insulin, leading to fewer GLUT4 receptors being available. This also results in hyperglycemia and the severe health problems associated with it. After a meal, glucose is continually entering the blood through the veins of the small intestines, causing blood glucose levels to rise. To review from our video on the hepatic portal circulation, all blood from the veins of the digestive tract pass through the liver before going on to the rest of the body. This means that as glucose enters the blood from the intestines, simultaneously insulin enters the blood from the pancreas. The glucose and insulin both flow through the liver first, before reaching the other organs of the body. The insulin allows the liver to increase its GLUT4 receptors and take in up to one-third of the newly absorbed glucose. The liver is then able to store this glucose as glycogen. Glycogen is a chain of glucose molecules kept inside cells of the liver as a storage place for glucose. The liver can also convert some glucose to fat, which the liver then secretes to be taken up by adipose tissue. Insulin can also increase GLUT4 receptors on skeletal muscle, and skeletal muscle can form its own glycogen. However, during exercise, when insulin levels are low, skeletal muscle can induce GLUT4 translocation by contracting. Thus, skeletal muscle does not require insulin to take in glucose during exercise. Additionally, the brain and kidneys never require insulin to take in glucose from the blood. Number 4. Glucagon and the liver work to increase blood glucose levels. Fasting and aerobic exercise are the main causes of a decrease in blood glucose levels. The body responds in three ways to a decrease in blood glucose. 
glucose sparing, glycogenolysis, and gluconeogenesis. When blood glucose levels drop, one response is to try to keep as much glucose in the blood as possible without actually increasing the amount of glucose in the blood. This is accomplished by making other fuel sources available. In response to a drop in blood glucose, alpha cells of the pancreas can secrete glucagon to stimulate the release of fatty acids and amino acids into the blood to be used as fuel sources instead of glucose. If cells begin using these other fuel sources, it will preserve the glucose in the blood available to the central nervous system. Additionally, during intense exercise when blood lactate levels rise, the heart can rely on lactate as a fuel and less on glucose as a fuel. By relying on other fuel sources, the tissues do not use as much glucose in the blood, which spares the glucose and is why the process is referred to as glucose sparing. Glycogenolysis is the breakdown of the glycogen stores in the liver. Glucagon can also stimulate glycogenolysis in the liver. Glucose molecules are broken off of glycogen and released into the blood, increasing the amount of glucose in the blood. However, there is an important difference between liver glycogen and skeletal muscle glycogen. Skeletal muscle glycogen is used as a fuel inside the muscle cell, but muscle glycogen is not released into the blood. Therefore, only liver glycogen can actually increase blood glucose levels, and liver glycogen plays a more important role in regulation of blood glucose than muscle glycogen. Lastly, to increase blood glucose, the liver can rely on gluconeogenesis, which is the production of new glucose molecules. The Cori cycle and the glucose alanine cycle are the most common pathways the liver uses in gluconeogenesis. In the normal breakdown of glucose inside a cell, glucose is split into two pyruvate molecules that are eventually degraded into two acetyl-CoA molecules. However, during intense exercise, so much glucose is taken up by the muscle cell that some of the pyruvate becomes lactate instead of acetyl-CoA. So much lactate can build up that the lactate diffuses out of the cell and enters the blood. This lactate is not forever lost, however. Besides being used as fuel in the heart, the liver can also take up the lactate and produce glucose, which is a process known as the Cori cycle. This is accomplished by simply reversing the process that produced the lactate. Two molecules of lactate are converted to pyruvate, and the two molecules of pyruvate are then combined to form one molecule of glucose. The glucose is then released from the liver into the blood, giving the contracting muscle another chance to use the glucose as fuel. Thus, the Cori cycle simply recycles lactate back to glucose when lactate levels are high and glucose levels are decreasing. The glucose alanine cycle is a similar process, except the liver uses the amino acid alanine instead of lactate to form new glucose that is released into the blood. Thus, when plasma glucose levels drop, increased availability of other fuel sources can spare glucose and help maintain glucose levels in the blood. The liver can respond by increasing the amount of glucose in the blood through breaking off glucose molecules through glycogenolysis and secreting the glucose into the blood. Lastly, the liver can produce new glucose through gluconeogenesis, utilizing the Cori cycle or the glucose alanine cycle, and releasing the newly formed glucose to the blood. Thanks for watching, and remember to subscribe to our channel.